composition course. She is remembered better, however, as a moving force in the 1971 Institute on National Affairs, a week-long institute which focused on the American Indian and in which tonight's speaker also participated. After that institute, Rick helped organize the United Native American Student Association and remained a strong supporter of American Indian concerns. After his graduation, Richard served in, as a civilian worker in a Vietnamese hospital. It was there that Richard Thompson died in a plane crash in November of 1973. The Vietnam War is over. The Vietnam era has ended. But for some of us, it will never end because we are too aware of the price that was paid during that moment in our history. It was a brief moment when one considers the 25,000 year history of American Indian people on this continent. That history is what, in many ways, tonight's speaker will be speaking about. N. Scott Marmaday, a Kiowa Indian, was born in 1934 and brought up on Indian reservations in the Southwest. He received his early schooling at Indian school and his college degree at Stanford University. He has been on the faculty of the University of California at Santa Barbara and has held a visiting appointment in the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of California in Berkeley. During the summer of 1969, he helped start an English studies program at the University of Michigan. He is now a professor of English and of Comparative Literature at Stanford University. Dr. Mamaday has received many honors, many awards for his poetry and his prose. The most important one being the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1969 for his novel, How Sweet a Dawn. The Way to Rainy Mountain is a collection of Kiowa Indian legends with personal and historical commentary. And Dr. Mamaday's most recent book is The Names, A Fresh Approach to Tracing One's Genealogy. Dr. Mamaday's work has appeared in a number of journals and magazines, including the Southern Review, the New Mexico, Port New Mexico Quarterly, Rampart, The Reporter, and Life. He reviews books frequently for the New York Times Book Review. Among the awards he has received are the Stanford University Creative Writing Fellowship, the John Hay Whitman Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and the University of California Institute for the Humanities Professor. <coughs> Dr. Mamaday holds three honorary degrees, which are included in Who's Who in America, Who's Who in the World, and the Dictionary of International Biography. It is a pleasure to introduce to you this evening Dr. N. Scott Mamaday. Good evening. Thank you. I'd like to talk to you this evening about several things, but I will focus my remarks upon the American Indian oral tradition and upon a concept which I call the man made of words. There is a Navajo ceremonial song which begins, voice above, voice of thunder, speak from the dark of clouds, voice below, grasshopper voice, speak from the green of plants, so may the earth be beautiful. There is in the idea of this song, a comprehension of the world that is peculiarly native, I believe, that is integral in the Navajo, indeed in the American Indian mentality. The singer stands at the center of sound, of motion, of life. Nothing within the whole sphere of being is inaccessible to him or lost upon him. At least we have the sense that this is so, and so does he. His song is full of reverence of wonder and delight, and of confidence as well. He knows something about himself and about the world in which he lives, and he knows that he knows. He is essentially at peace. I am interested in what he sees and in what he hears, 
in the range and force of his perception. Our immediate impression may be that his perception is vertical, voice above, voice below, he says. But is it vertical, or is it vertical only? At each level of his expression, there is an elaboration of sound and substance. The voice above is the voice of thunder, and thunder rolls. Moreover, it issues from the impalpable dark clouds and runs upon their horizontal range. It is a sound which integrates the whole of the atmosphere. And even so, the voice below, the grasshopper voice, issues from the whole landscape and multiplicity of plants. The singer points to nothing in particular and to everything in general. We are given the wide angle of his vision and of his hearing. This comprehension of the earth and air in language is a matter of morality, I believe, for it brings into account not only man's instinctive reaction to his environment, but the full realization of his humanity as well. The achievement of his intellectual and spiritual development as an individual and as a race. I'd like to give you another example of this calm and comprehensive view of things, this worldview, as it is sometimes called. Here is a prayer of the night chant, again from the Navajo. Once upon a time, I went to this prayer for the title of a book. As you listen to it, consider, if you will, the special character of the singer, the quality of his vision and of his being, and particularly at the end, consider the location of his voice in time and space. Tsegi ye, house made of dawn, house made of evening light, house made of the dark cloud, house made of male rain, house made of dark mist, house made of female rain house made of pollen, house made of grasshoppers. Dark cloud is at the door. The trail out of it is dark cloud. The zigzag lightning stands high upon it. Male deity, your offering I make. I have prepared a smoke for you. Restore my feet for me. Restore my legs for me. Restore my body for me. Restore my mind for me. Restore my voice for me. This very day, take out your spell for me. Your spell remove for me. You have taken it away for me. Far off it has gone. Happily, I recover. Happily, my interior becomes cool. Happily, I go forth. My interior feeling cool, may I walk. No longer sore, may I walk. With lively feelings, may I walk. As it used to be long ago, may I walk. Happily, may I walk. Happily, with abundant dark clouds, may I walk. Happily, with abundant showers, may I walk. Happily, with abundant plants, may I walk. Happily on a trail of pollen, may I walk. Happily, may I walk. Being as it used to be long ago, may I walk. May it be beautiful before me. May it be beautiful behind me. May it be beautiful below me. May it be beautiful above me. May it be beautiful all around me. In beauty, it is finished. It is by no means <coughs> accidental or insignificant that in both of these ceremonial songs which I have recited, the singer should have ended upon the notion of beauty, of beauty in the physical world, of man in the very presence and full awareness of that beauty. Neither is it insignificant that this whole and aesthetic sense should be expressed in language. 
Man has always tried to represent and even to recreate the world in words. One of our most venerable metaphors for poetry, as you know, is that of the Renaissance man holding up the mirror of language to the face of nature. Nor, of course, is it accidental or insignificant that we have here at the very center of the singer's purpose the language of prayer. The house of this prayer is the physical world itself. The singer affirms to himself and to his listeners those who by virtue of their spiritual cohesion share in his devotion that he has a whole and irrevocable investment in the whole world. At the level of rational statement, the prayer is profoundly simple and direct. The singer acknowledges the sacred reality of the world in its various aspects, and to that reality he makes his prayer as an offering, a pledge, as it were, of his integral involvement in it. He aspires to the very restoration of his body, his mind, and his spirit, which in his cultural and religious frame of reference is preeminently an aesthetics, a perception of well-ordered being and beauty, of which he is the human center. And the efficacy of his prayer is realized even as he utters it. In beauty, it is finished. This is, of course, but one dimension of the experience. There are others. The Indian, to a greater degree than most of us know, perhaps, locates the center of his being within the element of language. This prayer from the night chant is a case in point. The verbal formula is itself a religious context. That is to say, it is carefully uh, prescribed and traditional. It is not the singer's own device but a current into which he enters and is sustained in his spirit. He believes that language is intrinsically powerful, that it is yet another and indeed indispensable dimension of the house in which he dwells. It is moreover the dimension in which his existence is most fully accomplished. He does not create language, but is himself created within it. In a real sense, his language is both the object and the instrument of his ethical experience. Another dimension of this whole experience is, of course, the ceremony itself, of which this prayer is a small part. It is elaborate and of long duration, enveloping as it proceeds myriad other components of the relationship between man and the universe. Always in his religious, and artistic expression, the Indian is concerned to bring virtually all of his being to bear upon the act of spiritual affirmation. He brings his human strength to bear upon it, the whole strength of his body and his mind, and these forces he integrates in an imitation of the physical world and of its creatures. Nor is it imitation only as we are inclined to think of that word, Rather, it is more truly a kind of incorporation and synthesis, if you will, an appropriation of all that touches upon him in his coming and going. This is difficult for most of us to understand, perhaps, and it gives rise to certain ironies. The idea of appropriation and of the related terms appropriateness and propriety is at the heart of Indian religion and Indian art. Some time ago, I was told the story of an Indian man who had come upon bad times. He was without work, and he had a wife and children to support. <coughs> Moreover, his wife was expecting another child. One day, a friend came to visit and perceived that the man's situation was bad. He said to him, my friend, I see that you are poor, that you have no work and many mouths to feed, and there is no fresh meat in your larder. Now, I know you to be a hunter, and I know that there are deer in the mountains close by. Tell me, 
why don't you kill a deer that you and your family might have fresh meat to eat? After a time, the man answered, no, you see, it is inappropriate that I should take life just now when I am expecting the gift of life. My friend Vine Deloria, in one of his books, um, writes of an Indian woman whose child has died. A Christian man of the cloth comes to her, thinking to comfort her. She should not grieve, he says, for her child has succeeded to another and eternal life. But in this there is no solace for the woman, for grief is the appropriate expression of her life at the moment, and it is the only expression that is worthy of her and of her child. I am fond of telling stories. Let me tell you a story. One night a strange thing happened. I had written the greater part of the way to Rainy Mountain, all of it in fact, except the epilogue. I had set down the last of the old Kiowa tales in that volume, and I had composed both the historical and autobiographical commentaries for it. I had the sense of being out of breath of having said what it was in me to say on that subject. The manuscript lay before me in the bright light, small to be sure, but complete, or nearly so. I had written the second of the two poems in which that book is framed. I had uttered the last word, as it were. And yet, something was missing. A whole piece was missing. And I began once again to write. This is what I wrote. During the first hours after midnight, on the morning of November 13, 1833, it seemed that the world was coming to an end. Suddenly the stillness of the night was broken. There were brilliant flashes of light in the sky, light of such intensity that people were awakened by it. With the speed and density of a driving rain, stars were falling in the universe. Some were brighter than Venus. One was said to be as large as the moon. I went on to say that that event, the falling of the stars over the Earth, that explosion of Leonid meteors, which occurred more than 140 years ago now, is among the earliest entries in the Kiowa calendars. So deeply impressed upon the imagination of the Kiowas is that old phenomenon that it is remembered still. It has become a part of the racial memory. The living memory, I wrote, and the verbal tradition which transcends it were brought together for me once and for all in the person of Kosan. It seemed eminently right for me to deal with that old woman, Kosan, after all. She is among the most venerable people I have ever known. She spoke and sang to me one summer afternoon in Oklahoma. It was like a dream. When I was born, Kosan was already old. She was a grown woman when my grandparents came into the world. She sat perfectly still, folded over upon herself, and it did not seem possible to me that so many years, a century more or less, could be so compacted and distilled. Her voice shuddered, but it did not fail. Her songs were sad. An old whimsy, a delight in language, and in remembrance, shone in her one good eye. She conjured up the past, remembering perfectly the long continuity of her being. She imagined the lovely young girl, wild and vital, she had been. She imagined the sun dance. This is what she said. 
There was an old, old woman. She had something on her back, this old woman. The boys, the boys of the rabbit society went out to see what it was that she had on her back. It was a bag full of sandy earth. The woman had a bag full of sandy earth on her back. It was a certain kind of sand. That is what they must have in the lodge. The dancers must dance upon the sandy earth. The old woman held a digging tool in her hand. She turned towards the south and pointed with her lips. It was like a kiss. And she began to sing. Now we have brought the earth. Now it is time to play. As old as I am, I still have the feeling of play. That, said Kosan, was the beginning of the sun dance. Well, by this time, by this time, I was back into the book, caught up completely in the act of writing. I had projected myself, imagined myself out of the room and out of time. I was there with Kosan in the Oklahoma July. We laughed easily together. I felt that I had known her all my life, indeed, all of hers. I did not want to let go of her. But I had come to the end. And I sat down, almost grudgingly, the final sentences. It was, I wrote, all of this and more a quest, a going forth upon the way to Rainy Mountain. Probably Kosan, too, is dead now. At times, in the quiet of evening, I think she must have wondered, dreaming, who she was. Was she become in her sleep that old purveyor of the sacred earth, perhaps, that ancient one who, old as she was, still had the feeling of play? And in her mind, at times, did she see the falling stars? For some time, I sat looking down at these words on the page, trying to deal with the emptiness that had come about inside of me. The words did not seem real. The longer I looked at, at them, the more unfamiliar they became. At last, I could scarcely believe that they made sense, that they had anything whatsoever to do with meaning. In a kind of desperation, I went back over the final paragraphs, backwards and forwards, hurriedly. And my eyes fell upon the name Kosan. And all at once, Everything seemed suddenly to refer to that name. The name seemed to humanize the whole complexity of language before me. All at once, and absolutely, I had the sense of the magic of words and of names. Kosan, I said. And then it was that that ancient, one-eyed woman, Kosan, stepped out of the language and stood before me on the page. I was amazed, of course, and yet it seemed to me entirely appropriate that this should happen. Yes, grandson, she said. What is it? What do you want? Oh, well, I was just uh, now writing about you, I replied, stammering. I thought, forgive me, I, th I thought that perhaps you had, that you were 
No, she said, and she cackled, I thought, and she went on. You have imagined me well, grandson, and so I am. You have imagined that I dream, and so I do. I have seen the falling stars. Well, but all of this imagining, I protested, this has taken place, is taking place in my mind. You are not actually here. You are not really here in this room. It occurred to me that I was being extremely rude, but I couldn't help myself. Anyway, she seemed to understand. Be careful of your pronouncements, grandson, she answered. You imagine that I am here in this room, do you not? That is worth something. You see, I have existence, whole being, in your imagination. It is but one kind of being, to be sure, but it is perhaps the best of all kinds. And grandson, if I am not here in this room, then surely neither are you. I, th I think I see what you mean, I said meekly, and I felt justly rebuked. Tell me, grandmother, how old are you? Oh, I do not know, she replied. There are times when I think that I am the oldest woman on earth. You know the Kiowas came into the world through a hollow log. In my mind's eye, I have seen them emerge one by one from the mouth of that log. I have seen them so clearly, how they were dressed, how delighted they were to see the world around them. I must have been there, and I must have taken part in that old migration of the Kiowas from the Yellowstone to the Southern Plains, for I have seen antelope bounding in the tall grass near the Bighorn River, and I have seen the ghost forests of the Black Hills. Once, once I saw the red cliffs of Palo Duro Canyon. You are indeed very old, I said. And you have seen many things. Yes, I imagine that I have, she said. And then she turned slowly around, nodded once, and receded into the language I had made. And then I imagined that I was in the room alone. Who is the storyteller? Of whom is the story told? What is there in the darkness to imagine into being? What is there to dream and to relate? What happens when I, or anyone, exerts the force of language upon the unknown? These are the questions which interest me most. If there is any absolute assumption in back of my thoughts on this occasion, it is this that we are what we imagine. Our very existence consists in our imagination of ourselves. Our best destiny is to imagine at last and completely who and what and that we are. The greatest tragedy that can befall us is to go unimagined. I would like to return to the falling stars, and let me proceed this time from a slightly different point of view. In the winter of 1833, the Kiowas were camped on Elm Fork, a branch of the Red River, 
in the Wichita Mountains. In the preceding summer, they had suffered a massacre at the hands of another tribe. And Taime, their sacred sun dance fetish and most powerful medicine, had been stolen. At no time in the history of their migration from the north and in the evolution of their plains culture had the Kiowas been more vulnerable to despair. The loss of Taime was a deep psychological wound. In the early cold of November 13, there occurred over the earth an explosion of meteors. The Kiowas were awakened by the sterile light of falling stars and they ran out into the false day and were terrified. The year the stars fell, 1833, is among the earliest entries in the Kiowa calendars, as I have said, and it is permanent in the Kiowa mind. You see, there was symbolic meaning in that November sky. With the coming of natural dawn, there began a new and darker age for the Kiowa people and the last culture to evolve in North America began to decline. Within four years of the falling stars, the Kiowas signed their first treaty with the United States government. Within 20 years, four major epidemics of smallpox and Asiatic cholera destroyed more than half their number. And within scarcely more than a generation, their horses and weapons were taken from them, and the herds of buffalo were slaughtered and left to waste upon the plains. Do you see what happens when the imagination is superimposed upon the historical event? It becomes a story. The whole piece becomes more deeply invested with meaning. The terrified Kiowas, when they had regained possession of themselves, did indeed imagine that the falling stars were symbolic of their being and of their destiny. They accounted for themselves with reference to that awful memory. They appropriated it, recreated it, fashioned it into an image of themselves. In short, they imagined it. And by means of that act of the imagination, could they bear what happened to them thereafter? No defeat, no humiliation, no suffering was beyond their power to endure, for none of it was meaningless. They could say to themselves, yes, yes, it was all meant to be in its time. The order of the world was broken, that was clear. Even the stars were shaken loose in the night sky. The imagination of meaning it was not much, perhaps, but it was all they had, and it was enough to sustain them. A writer for whom I have great admiration, Isaac Dinesen, said this, all sorrows can be born if you put them into a story or tell a story about them. The Kiowa tales, which are contained in The Way to Rainy Mountain, constitute a kind of literary chronicle. In a sense, they are the milestones of that old migration in which the Kiowas journeyed from the Yellowstone to the Washita. They record a transformation of the tribal mind as it encounters for the first time the landscape of the Great Plains. They evoke the sense of search and of discovery. Many of the tales are very old, and they have not until now been set down in writing. Among them, there is one that stands out in my mind. When I was a child, my father told me the story of the arrow maker, and he told it to me many times, for I fell in love with it. I have no memory that is older than that of hearing this story. If an arrow is well made, it will have tooth marks upon it. That is how you know. 
The Kiowas made fine arrows and straightened them in their teeth. Then they drew them to the bow to see that they were straight. Once there was a man and his wife. They were alone at night in their teepee. By the light of a fire, the man was making arrows. After a while, he caught sight of something. There was a small opening in the teepee where two hides had been sewn together. Someone was there on the outside looking in. The man went on with his work, but he said to his wife, Someone is standing outside. Do not be afraid. Let us talk easily as of ordinary things. Then, as it was right for him to do, he, he took an arrow and straightened it in his teeth. Then he drew it to the bow and took aim, first in this direction and then in that. And all the while, he was talking as if to his wife. But this is how he spoke. I know that you are there on the outside, for I can feel your eyes upon me. If you are a Kiowa, you will understand what I am saying. And you will speak your name. But there was no answer. And the man went on in the same way, pointing the arrow all around. At last, his aim fell upon the place where his enemy stood, and he let go of the string. The arrow went straight to the enemy's heart. Until now, the story of the arrow maker has been the private possession of a very few, a tenuous link in that most ancient chain of language which we call the oral tradition. Tenuous because the tradition itself is so. For as many times as that story has been told, it was always but one generation removed from extinction. But it was cherished, too, and for the same reason. That is to say, it has been neither more nor less durable than the human voice, and neither more nor less concerned to express the fundamental meaning of the human condition. And this brings me to the matter at hand. The story of the arrow maker is also a link between language and literature, between language and religion. It is a remarkable act of the mind a realization of words and a realization of the world that is altogether simple and direct, yet nonetheless rare and profound. And it illustrates more clearly than anything else in my own experience, at least, something of the essential character of the imagination and, in particular, of that personification which in this instance emerges from the imagination, the man made of words. It is a fine story, I think you will agree, whole, intricately beautiful, precisely realized. It is worth thinking about, for it yields something of value. Indeed, it is full of provocation, rich with suggestion and consequent meaning. It is informed by an integrity that bears examination easily and well. And in the process, it seems to appropriate our own reality, our own experience our own conception of the truth. It is, a sig it is significant that the story of the arrow maker returns upon itself in a special way. It is about language, after all. And it is therefore part and parcel of its own subject. Virtually, there is no distinction, no difference between the telling and that which is told. The point of the story lies not so much in what the arrow maker does, but in what he says. The principal fact is that he speaks, 
and in so doing, he places his very life in the balance. It is this aspect of the story which might interest us most, for it is here that the language becomes most conscious of itself, and we are very close to the origin and object of literature. Our sense of the verbal dimension is very keen, and we are aware of something in the nature of language that is at once perilous and compelling. If you are a Kiowa, you will understand what I am saying, and you will speak your name. Everything is ventured in this simple declaration, which is also a question and a plea. The conditional element with which it begins is remarkably tentative and pathetic. Precisely at this moment is the arrow maker realized completely, and his reality consists in language, and it is poor and precarious. And all of this, all of this occurs to him as surely as it does to us. Implicit in that simple occurrence is all of his definition and all of his destiny. He ventures to speak because he must. Language is the repository of his whole knowledge and experience, of his whole being, and it represents the only <coughs> chance he has for survival. Instinctively and with great care, he deals in the most honest way with words. Let us talk easily as of ordinary things. And of the ominous unknown, he asks only the utterance of a name, only that most nominal sign that he has understood that his words are returned to him on the sheer edge of meaning. But there is no answer, and the arrow maker knows at once what he has not known before, that his enemy is and that he, the arrow maker, has gained an advantage over his enemy. This he knows certainly, and the certainty itself is his advantage, and it is crucial, and he makes the most of it, and he survives. The venture is complete and irrevocable, and for the arrow maker it ends in success. The story is meaningful, it is so primarily because it is composed of language, and it is in the nature of language that it proceeds to the formulation of meaning. Moreover, the story of the arrow maker, as opposed to other stories in general, centers upon this procession <coughs> of words towards meaning. It seems, in fact, to turn upon the very idea that language involves the elements of risk and responsibility. And in this, the story seeks to confirm itself. In a word, it seems to say, everything is a risk. That may be so, and it may be that the whole of literature rests upon that truth. The arrow maker is preeminently the man made of words, he has consummate being in language. It is the world of his origin and of his posterity, and there is no other. But it is a world of definite reality and of infinite possibility. I have come to believe that there is a sense in which the arrow maker has more nearly perfect being than have other men by and large, and perhaps a more nearly perfect right to be. We can imagine him, as he imagines himself, whole and vital, going on into the unknown darkness and beyond. And this last aspect of his being is primordial and profound. And yet, yet the story has it that he is cautious and alone. And we are given to understand that his peril is great and immediate and that he confronts it in the only way he can. I have no doubt that this is true, and I believe that there are implications which point, point directly to the determination of our <coughs> ethical experience and which must not be lost upon us. 
One final word, then, on an essential irony which, which marks this story and gives peculiar substance to the man made of words. The storyteller, the man who first told the story of the arrow maker, is nameless and illiterate. From one point of view, we know very little about him, except that he is somehow translated for us in the person of the arrow maker. But from another point of view, that is really all we need to know. He tells us of his life in language and of the awful risk involved. It must occur to us that he is one with the arrow maker and that he has survived by word of mouth beyond other men. I said a moment ago that for the arrow maker, language represented the only chance for survival. <coughs> it is worth considering that he survives in our time and that he has survived over a period of untold generations. Aho. So I leave this on for the question. They have, they have to formulate some. It'll take a minute. There is one. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Mama, they were <coughs> The, the, yes, the question, the question is, um, <coughs> have I found out uh, since, since talking to Mr. Walker several years ago the meaning of the staked plains, that term, the staked plains, which refers to um, uh, an arboreal desert region of the southwest, mainly in, in uh, Texas? <coughs> and the answer is no. <laughs> I have, I have heard a number of theories, but I still uh, am not sure what, what the name refers to. The, 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 the theory I like best is that it is such a vast region and so many people were lost moving across it that uh, journeymen then uh, began staking their, their route through it so that they could return by means of the visible stakes in the ground. But I, that's just a theory. I'm not sure about it at all. If anyone in the audience knows and can enlighten us, please, uh, please do. Thank you. Yes. Um, in terms of the oral literature that's extant today, <coughs> what is the degree of self-awareness of the importance of the tale as the teller tells them and retells them to be carried on? They're built into the tale that self-consciousness of importance. I'm not sure that I understand the question. Can you give it to me one once more? Yeah, um, as the you know, as the uh, chief or whoever uh, carries on the oral tradition, is he aware that what he is carrying on is important? Does he instill that in the tales themselves, that indeed they are important and that they ought to be carried on? Yes, I think I understand now. The question, could you all hear it? OK. Um, I, think, I think the answer is the, the storyteller is highly aware of his, of his function, of what he is doing in uh, passing on uh, this verbal tradition from one generation to another. And I think that the tales do reflect that concern. A number, I, I, one, of the, one of the astounding things, uh, one of the things that astounded me in looking into the Kiowa oral tradition was the fact that so many of the stories I ran upon had to do in one way or another with language, like the arrow maker story. That, that is a, a kind of um, 
an analogy of the, of the oral tradition. It, it is true that the, that the story really centers upon language and upon the importance of language and upon the understanding of the importance of language. And that's true of, um, of many stories in, in the oral tradition. So I think that there is a high degree of, of uh, self-awareness and that that awareness is reflected very clearly in the stories themselves. Yes? <clears throat> Do you see any, well, parallels within the Judeo-Christian tradition to these, and the emphasis, well, say like from John on the <clears throat> word, and either in the, the spoken word or in this case the written word, uh, do you find any parallels within the tradition? Do I find any parallels in the, in the <coughs> Judeo-Christian and Native American traditions, uh, oral traditions. Yes, they, there are striking parallels uh, on many different levels. Uh, I can't go into all of them I, uh, here, but I can assure you that there are many, many parallels. The, cer the naming ceremony, for example, naming, the, the idea of conferring a name upon something and in that act conferring being upon that thing at the same time is, um, is an ancient uh, and, and biblical notion, of course, and it is widespread in the Indian world. It perhaps is more vital in the Indian world now than it is in the Judeo-Christian tradition. I, I'm just surmising that, but I know that it's very vital in, um, in the Indian world. Um, I had another example in mind as I started that, and I've, I've lost it. But, um, oh, I was going to say that uh, an excellent um, brief discussion of, of some of those parallels is contained in Margot Astro's introduction to the anthology, which is called The Winged Serpent. Uh, and it's a Capricorn paperback, readily available. American Indian prose and poetry, Margot Astrove, A-S-T-R-O-V. She talks about and, and uh, refers particularly to the, the, the concept that in the beginning was the word. So do I, by the way, in uh, my novel, uh, House Made of Dawn. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a very definite implication within the commentary of Deloria as well as within the commentaries of uh, the Wolf book that's just come out about our own Meskwaki, that uh, <coughs> we hear, we and the anthropologist hear, but does not reverence other stories. We may reverence our own, and that's just debatable, but we definitely do not reverence the native stories enough. And this implication is very strong within these two books and within much native literature of the world. Is it correct? Could you all hear that question? Um, there, there is a strong implication in, in uh, some of Vine Deloria's writing and in other writings, recent writings, that the anthropologists uh, hear but do not reverence uh, the stories within Native American oral tradition. Is that true? I think it's true to an extent. I don't know how far I would want to to generalize that point. I think it is probably true for the most part. However, there are exceptions. I know of anthropologists who are extremely sensitive to Indian traditions and who do reverence, uh, reverence the stories in those traditions. I'm thinking particularly of uh, such works as Theodora Krober's The Inland Whale, which seems to me a very sensitive uh, uh, treatment of uh, California Indian stories. And there are other such things. Maybe the answer is that the, that the, the sensitivity is increasing and that the, the situation is changing for the better. I hope so. Other questions? You can make comments, too, or accusations, or whatever you want. Well, thank you for listening to me.